four, three. We'll do it live. Yeah. The general craziness of it, the impact on your life. We have gone through so many stories and we said, you know what? This should not be kept to the two of us. Hi, Megan. Hi, Erin. How are you? Good. I did my hair for you today. Thank you. You see that? You look beautiful. I just want you to know that. Why are you doing your hair when your husband's not home? Who are you trying to look good for, Megan? You, Erin. For you. (laughs) That's what you just said. (laughs) It's good to see you. You too. Okay. So I've got to ask the question. First of all, um, I heard about a bachelorette party, so I'm going to need to hear that story. And I'm glad you saved it for everyone because it seems like it's going to be a good one. But first I did my own makeup today and I tried real, real hard. Okay. Real, real hard. It looks fine. It's regular making, making, makeup, (laughs) Megan makeup. But I had my makeup done by a pro last week, and I forgot how much better they do than us. I don't know what you have to wear when you're on camera. It's wild, though. It's just absolutely like I look at this and I'm like, oh, it just doesn't even look the same. And I feel like I put a lot of effort into it. It doesn't look like it, though. You don't get graded on effort in this game, Megan. I'm sorry. I know. No, but you look beautiful. Well, thank you. Um, Super excited about today's guest. I am too. I can't wait to hear about, okay, so what we have experienced in our old industry is not just locked to our old industry. So we're going to dip our toes into another one today. Yes. Understand a little Coming from TV. So today's guest describes herself as a recovering slash aspiring news producer at Court TV, NBC News. She was in the sports department, many other departments. We would like to welcome Maureen Clough. Maureen, thank you for being with us. Hi, ladies. I'm so happy to be here. I love what you're doing. Well, we are glad to have you because you have so many wonderful stories and good things to say. I connected with you on LinkedIn because you were commenting on another like crazy toxic TV news post. (laughs) And what you had to say, I was like, I need to know this woman and I need to have her on the show. This is actually a commercial for LinkedIn. (laughs) Really? No, it's, it's true. It's, it's really wonderful to people with whom I've connected on LinkedIn. And it's so much fun to actually be reconnected to the news industry, which frankly is full of a lot of great people. So despite the problems therein, Wonderful, wonderful human beings. So thanks for having me. Well, before I get into my bachelorette story, though, (laughs) I want to tell everybody how old I am, which is I am I'm now 42, which I did just have my birthday, but I'm I'm much older than that in real life because (laughs) it's about news years. (laughs) Yes, it's I don't know if you're aware of this, Maureen, but she recently started knitting. So she's now about the equivalent of an 83 year old. Yeah, that's on you though. Yeah. (laughs) You wasted your mind. Even when I was very young, that's how I like to describe it. You're an old soul, right? I'm an old soul. So I go to this bachelorette party with one of my wonderful friends, and she's, you know, beautiful. And we're in Charleston, South Carolina, which, unbeknownst to me, is the bachelorette capital of the world. I mean, there is Nashville, but my goodness. I felt very old and out of place. So hold on, excuse me. How old is your friend? 41. (laughs) She's one year younger. Okay, go ahead. First marriage though, she just waited to find the right guy. So we go to the obligatory club and we are dancing. And there is this, I'm dancing. This guy comes over and he starts to dance with me, right? Okay. And my first reaction is, what is he doing? He's trying to take my wallet. (laughs) Well, I give him the dirtiest look and he kind of moves away and I'm like checking and I'm like, oh, I still have my wallet. And then I was like, oh, wait, he actually. <laughs> That's incredible. Aaron. I don't, I don't think he was coming for your wallet. No, he wasn't. But no. again, because I'm so old, that was my first Where reaction. You? I was like, wait a minute, you. Wait a second. Get away. What were you drinking? What, what was your drink of choice at this time? I was actually sober. She wow. was drinking Ovaltine. <laughs> <laughs> So that is my funny story, but it is a perfect seg and pivot to Maureen because Maureen, you are kind of, you have left TV. We'll get into why you left TV, but right now you are talking about ageism 
in the tech industry, which I can only imagine. To, to tell us what you're doing now. Explain it better than I can. So I have had at this point what I guess would be considered a long tech career. I started in tech, I guess, back in 2009. And so I was at a bunch of different companies, some of whom were, you know, market leaders, pretty big, lots of employees, some of whom were actually very small venture backed startups. And one common thread was throughout, and it was that there was nobody old there. And I really felt this when I was 37 years old and my Gen Z colleague called me Dino. And I was like, what are you? Oh, and then I looked around, I was like, oh my God, he's, he's right. Like I am ancient. My CEO's younger than I am. My boss is younger than wow. I am. C-suite's younger than I am. I'm like, what is going on? And so I started getting really curious about the topic. I started getting my hands on everything I could find. Turns out there's not a lot of data out there. I think probably like frankly by design in large part. So it's not something that they really want out there. And actually it's, it's somewhat of an open secret that there's a huge preference for youth. And that's something that I know is very much the case in the news industry if you're a woman, right? So yeah. men are allowed to age, but women are not. And in the tech industry, it's a little bit more of an equal opportunity shitstorm, whereas everybody is expected to stay young forever. It's, okay, it's a quite right. bizarre situation. Explain to me, what would the why of it be? Like take political correctness out of it or whatever. Like what, why do they want younger? What, what is that all about? Well, uh, the cynic in me tells you that it's because they want to pay people very little. They want to exploit the worker. And so I can remember at one such startup, I was repeatedly told, hey, Maureen, remember that even the secretaries at Microsoft ended up millionaires. And I was a little bit older at the time this was spoken to me. And I was like, I know how venture capital works. I know what options versus equity are. I know what the, the pot looks like. I know about common shares and what's up. And and you're preying on people's ignorance. So you're taking people straight out of college and you're telling them, you're selling them this dream that is very unlikely to come true and it's exploitative. And when you're young, you don't have boundaries. You haven't been around as long. You don't know where you can put your foot down. You don't know your worth, right? And so I very much think a lot of this is intentional. It's to get people drinking Kool-Aid right away out of the gates. And when you find someone who's older, even though they come with them all the wisdom and experience and expertise, they also have boundaries. They have a backbone. And so I think that there's just this incumbent sort of pressure to keep the tech teams younger because you don't run into so much, right? And, and let's also face it, venture capital tends to seek out people who look like Mark Zuckerberg, people who look like Sam Bankman fried these young tech founders. That's the prototype. That's the archetype that they're looking for. And those people bring with them that youth that, you know, they're similar pools. And, and that's what they want. They want people they can mold and shape. They don't necessarily want to hear you say, ooh, I was at this other company and I saw how that played out. And let me save you this because they have, frankly, somewhat of a God complex, right? So I think that's a lot of what's in play here. And then there's also this sort of stereotype that tech itself is all about innovating and breaking things and disrupting categories. And that when you're old, you can't do that. And that's completely wrong. Like I change all the time and I'm so much better than I ever was in the past, right? Because of my experience, because of my age. But that's all just, you know, it, it depends on the tech CEO and the tech company, of course, but there's a lot of that in play, a ton of that in play. So can I you feel very seen right now. <laughs> I know. I, that's so cute. This, it sound, I mean, it's, it sounds very familiar. It's the <sighs> same thing. Sorry because to hear essentially that. essentially it's like, you know, when you're young and inexperienced, you also, chances are, you, maybe you don't have a family yet. You don't exactly. have children who rely on you and you don't have as many things that you may need to deal with. Your job is your baby when you're younger. Exactly. Uh, and that's so, what they want. Right. If you can use those people. So explain to me a little bit about the options versus equity thing. So you're saying they're allowing these people to have options, which means they have a chance to buy the stock later Precisely. as opposed to getting the stock. That's exactly right. And it's a quite different thing, right? And especially when you're young in your career, if you don't really understand what options means and, and you don't have a lot of money of your own accord, you haven't saved a bunch because you're early in your career, you don't necessarily, unless you've actually read like venture capital for dummies or something, you don't know what it means to have options in a company.
And so I can tell you experience from speaking with people around in my community where they've had people exit companies and say, okay, yeah, hey, I'd like to cash in on my options. And they're like, oh, that is not how that works. Like you're going to have to pony up. And so people know that and they know these founders know when they offer these options to people that quite so, so many of them are actually just never going to cash in. And so the pot will continue to be, you know, on their side of the fence. It's not actually going to be distributed to the common worker. So it, that's another frustration for me when I think about just the exploitative nature of it versus equity, where it's like you actually own a piece of the company, right? There is a difference. Golden handcuffs. We've talked about yeah. that before, right? Yep. Right. This is interesting. I, I have a lot. Um, I, I can't wait to dive into this with you, Maureen, but let's quickly talk about your background with TV because I can tell already you are very good at telling a story, right? <laughs> Clearly you're very good at communicating with people. I'm sure you would have done a bang up job in TV. <laughs> so what you, where did you start and why did you leave? So I started as an intern, as many do. I was fortunate enough to get a sports internship at the NBC affiliate King 5 in Seattle, which was a lot of fun. You know, interns do a bit of grunt work, but you really do get a, you know, a front seat view into what the industry is like. And so that was very impactful for me. And I was very grateful for it. I, I very quickly learned I didn't want to go into sports because I entered a couple uh, uh, locker rooms and was like, oh, never again, like not happening. Like yeah. being a woman in that world. Wow. Uh, hats off to people who can handle that, but it was not for me. Um, but I, I, I had a couple kind of missteps in my career. I was early and young and didn't know exactly what I wanted. And so I started in law. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer for a hot second after being the court, or excuse me, the Tufts University uh, television anchor at my little TU TV station. So big time, guys, huge, <laughs> huge. The numbers were nuts. It was a top 10 market. <laughs> um, but so I did that and I loved it. It was really, really fun. Um, but I, I thought for some reason, I think it was more, if I'm being really honest with you, it's because I wanted my parents to be proud of me. And I was like, I should go be a lawyer just like dad. And so what did I do? I started to apply to law school and I was like, oh, this is actually not for me. After I actually spent some time as a paralegal, I was like, this is, this is not as I said, this is not, this is not my highest and best use. So I decided to get back into TV and I found myself through networking. Thank God, by the way, networking is everything, but I found myself at court TV and was an associate producer there. And Court TV it was an awesome place. Like I absolutely love the people that I met there. I'm still friends with them, you know, online and whatnot. Unfortunately, I no longer live in New York City, which was amazing, by the way. Um, so I haven't kept in as close touch with them as I would have liked. But it was very much like being in the trenches, you know. And, and mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was at first on the trial team, so I was actually producing the trials on Court TV. So that means like going through hours of people on the stand and trying to find sound bites and putting, you know, chirons together and clipping all, all that and trying to make what is typically extremely boring interesting. So that's that, that was that was tough. Um, but then I moved into Court TV headlines, which was basically like the news breaks. So every hour on the hour. One of the anchors who at the time was Savannah Guthrie, that was one of the anchors there. And now she's on the Today Show, which is so crazy to see her meteoric rise. Are you connected with her on LinkedIn? I am not. I wish I were. I'm, <laughs> yeah, no. But I used to I used to actually pull her stories and her clips and all the all the things on the APR. But um, but that was a really cool experience because that was much more traditional news than the other parts of Court TV, yeah. as you can imagine, right? Um, but I worked with her, I worked with Ashley Banfield. Ashley Banfield was incredible, by the way, such a wonderful mentor to me. So hat tip to her. Um, great human. But uh, but I started to basically get panic attacks, you guys, because if it bleeds, it's le it leads is so true. And so yeah. I was convinced that, you know, every single person I would run into after dark was a murderer and I was going to die. And I was like, mm -hmm. this is not great. I'm having nightmares. Like, is this my future if I stay in television? And I, I knew the pitfalls of actually working in local news. I knew how beholden you were to just like the whims of a news director in some podunk town forever away from you, where you wouldn't necessarily be doing more than earning, you know, a very small hourly wage, buying your own health insurance, carrying your own camera. So I started to learn what it was really going to be like. And I thought, I think I want to have a little bit more control over my life and where I land than being at the whim of, of a news director. But that's so amazing I, that you learned that so young because it took us <laughs> oh, to almost 20 years. No, yeah. and, and we didn't even learn it until we were, again, kicked <laughs> we off, were, the yeah, off the merry-go-round. Yeah, off the merry-go-round. 
it, it is. And, and there are so many things that I think you do learn. And I feel like with the experiences you have, I'm sure you were able to apply that to the tech world when you got in. So I'm sure, sure. things you learned in TV were valuable. What exactly do you do in tech? Because I know there's like a million jobs. So what is it that you're doing now? Well, right now I don't have a job. I've been laid off twice within the last year, which is a very interesting moment. I'd never experienced that before. So it's real. What you're hearing about the tech layoffs, it's 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 yeah. impacting quite a few people and it's pretty grim. Um, that said, there are still companies hiring for sure. That's so there are two sides to every story, as you all well know. Uh, but I have been working in business development and partnerships for quite some time now. So that is essentially creating new arrangements with external partners to a company and getting them to understand the product that we sell and actually get their clients to use it as well. Okay. So it's a chance. Well, I, wanna, I want to so take one step back, it. though. You said TV, too toxic, too terrible, hours, PTSD, anxiety. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go into tech. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that too. So, but There's what, what made you, to, I mean, I, I, I know very little about tech, but I know it is known as being a toxic industry where they expect you to devote your soul. Yeah. Yeah. And at certain companies, they a hundred percent do. And again, like the, the preference for youth, I believe is that they recognize that those people don't know any better. They don't know what a regular work week looks like. They think that this is just all there is. And I'm here to tell you there's more. <laughs> you well, can't. It's also a badge of honor too, right? I think that's yeah, similar no, to TV 100%. where it's like, I worked 80 hours last week and I slept in the closet. Yes, there is that. There absolutely is that. And some companies, that's all they want. That's right. all they want. And I have been fortunate to find myself in companies that are not exactly like that most of the time. And if they are, like, I just don't do it. So you teach yeah. people how you want to be treated is my creed, right? So when I come into a new organization, I quite intentionally am not answering emails all hour of the night because I'm like, if I do that, they're going to expect that I continue to do so. It's setting the standard. And so you kind of set yourself up for failure. But again, does a new graduate know that? No. And that's probably why they want them. They're more malleable. They're more able to just, you know, take the Kool-Aid and keep rolling. And mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, they come with they come with a lot of, you know, energy and all the things that they are putting in their job descriptions, too, mm -hmm. which is really cloaked language for we want young workers, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is illegal to actually say out loud. So they try and couch it with like, we're looking for a hungry ninja. You know, it's like that <laughs> is the kind of thing. But right. I, over time, got smarter about it and recognized where I should not be, right? And so I could start to see through the BS. I could start to yeah. see through that language and job descriptions and whatnot. But you mentioned though recently on a LinkedIn post that you have advice for older people applying to jobs. And, and yes. I think the language you used was to Botox your resume. Yep. What does that mean? That, that means you need yeah. to make yourself look a hell of a lot younger than you actually are chronologically on your resume and on your LinkedIn. Because the fact of the matter is it's a crowded market out there. It's saturated. There are tons of job seekers for not that many positions. And you should make it as easy as possible for people to say, yes, you know what? I would like to have her in for an interview. Don't set yourself up to be potentially discriminated against. Because guess what? We live in a super ageist society. I'm ageist. I'm working on it. Like we've been fed this our entire lives. You guys know we've been told to age is a moral sin for women. Like we're, we're not allowed to do it, especially in the public eye for you guys. I'm sure I can only imagine what you've seen actually living in the news world for longer than I even was. Right. But it's just super toxic. It's grotesque. Men are allowed to age and women aren't. And so, especially if you're a woman, you need to Botox your resume. I mean, I, I routinely hear from people who are either my guests or my friends off the record telling me, Maureen, I feel this pressure to look at least 10 years younger than my age when I'm working in tech. Otherwise, I'm going to be considered obsolete. I'm not going to be relevant. People aren't going to take me seriously. And that is so freaking true. I feel it too. I'm only 40. But I, I mean, I was a dino at 37. It's real. And what's been so frustrating to me is like no one has been talking about it and it's right there under the surface. Yeah. And so that's what I really set out to do with It Gets Late Early is really bring it to the forefront of everybody's minds and really pull it into the diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives that should have age as a factor because age in tech is an underrepresented group, period. Now, I understand that obviously they're looking for that younger, hungry person who's willing to pay their bucket of blood in, you know, eight <laughs> hours or whatever. But 
I guess what I don't understand is why they don't value. Okay. In TV, we know that they want the people who, you know, are on camera maybe to look younger. They'll never actually say it necessarily, but the vibe is there and you can read through it. In tech, I don't really understand why they wouldn't value more experience because ideally looks are not coming into the picture as much. So why does ideally. the experience not matter? Ideally. Um, I think it's different for men and women, as is true in pretty much anything in society. Unfortunately, that's where we are. Um, but as far as experience not mattering, I think especially if you have younger people at the helm, if you have a CEO who is in his or her, and usually, let's be honest, usually his 20s, right, yeah. or 30s, there might not be that specific reverence for people who've been there before, right? There's there's a sense that tech is constantly evolving, constantly changing, and thus someone who's younger, the stereotype is that, that younger people can pick that up more quickly, and that wow. older people are stuck in their ways, and like, you can't teach an old dog new trips, tricks. Like, this is actually how people think, whether they say it out loud or not. Mm -hmm. And so you can have a perfect set of, you know, internal, uh, internal rubric and methodology and different systems in place and whatnot, but people are still making up companies and people yeah. come to work with their own biases, subconscious or not, unconscious or not every yeah. single day. And so it plays out. And, you know, I've talked to people on my podcast who have been trying to apply for jobs, for example, in their sixties. And they're like, I can't get through to, you know, a couple rounds in because they think in large part, they're met with a very young green recruiter who is looking, wow. there's an affinity bias, right? Like, likes, like. So they see someone who could be their grandfather and they think, oh, you know, he's not going to be a culture fit. Like there's this really sort of veiled language in there and there's the concept of culture fit. And what that means really is more people like us. And so what that ends up being in tech quite frequently at younger startup sort of oriented cultures, especially, is a lot of young white men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, Maureen, because when I, I did first stalk you on LinkedIn, LinkedIn, <laughs> when I saw your post and I was like, what is this young, hot woman doing <sighs> carrying a flag? for ageism. Because I mean, I guess only in tech would this make sense where you're the standard bearer <laughs> for like ageism. Because I was like, I wouldn't pick up this fight, right? Because I mean, <laughs> technically, I wouldn't see it as my battle. But hearing you talk about it, it's really interesting. Have you found an audience with your podcast? I really have. And it's been so gratifying. I mean, I think the funny part about the audience build in this particular subject is there aren't a ton of people who would necessarily come out and publicly say like, hi, I'm old. I love your podcast because no <laughs> one wants to self-identify as old. Yeah. You should see my DMs. You should see my emails. Like people reach out to me and they say, thank you so much for doing this. I've been mm. feeling this for ages and I just didn't, I felt so alone. And now I understand it's not just me and that there's data to back up what I'm feeling. And, you know, thanks for taking the charge. And I think the sad part about being female in this society is that I, I truly believe this to my core. If I were 10 plus years older, I don't think people would, would talk to me as much. I don't think people would take me as seriously. People routinely discard people over 50, especially if you're a woman. And so it's almost as though, and I really hate to say this because I certainly don't want to give any, <laughs> any more basis to this concept, but there there is this sense if women are complaining or talking about something that's an issue, they're like a shrill nag, Right. And so being younger, I think I have a little bit more latitude to do that, which is grossly unfair. And by the way, I'm going to be there like tomorrow, right? And the oh, people we all that, are. Yeah. We all are. And yep. the, the alternative kind of sucks. So like, let's embrace it, you know? Like right. it, this, it, we're all going to get there. And I turned 40 and I never really thought it was going to happen to me. It's like aging happens to other people. It's <laughs> like I'm still 25 in my mind. Right? I like, don't know about you guys, but I still like, I'll see 25 year olds and feel like I'm their age and then realize that I'm not. <laughs> That's exactly. I was talking to my friend the other day. I was like, I, I was walking around and it was near a college campus and I always feel like, oh yeah, I still look pretty young. And then I see actual college students and I'm like, oh, oh yeah. no, no, I don't. Like they're like, babies. That's cool. they're babies they're babies and they have oh, yeah. so much value too. That's the other thing. Like ageism does go about both ways. Like you can a hundred percent be discriminated against for being too young yes. as well. And I have to tell you, 
I, I had a career coach who once said, you need a board of directors and you need to have people in the younger demographic and the older demographic. And, you know, I realized that I was naturally doing that because I learned so much from both sides of the spectrum mm -hmm. and it's enriched my life and my career and my growth so much sure. to do so. So mm -hmm. there you go. Basically it just means like diversity across all different spectrums is important. It's mm -hmm. going to make your company better. It's going to make the world better. It's going to make yeah. you better as a human. That being said, I don't, I don't see it changing in TV news at the very least. Yeah. Um, not maybe not we're talking game, right? about it more, but so I was, I, again, this bachelorette party was with a bunch of TV people who are now almost all <laughs> former TV people yeah. uh, because we are older. Uh, but one of my girlfriends who was in the Boston market, she was saying, oh my gosh, Aaron, they are just the youngest, hottest reporters you have ever seen. I'm They're sure. in their twenties and they look like models. I believe it because yeah. that's what's that's what women are valued on in this society, and it's disgusting. I hate it. And they're I probably not it. paying them very well either, probably which not. is the bad part. <laughs> right, probably and not. and that's not to say that they can't tell a great story. I was putting together great stories when yeah. I was in my twenties sure for you sure. Were. However, and I think this is what you're speaking to, Maureen. What is lost, and I think especially in TV news, is knowing the market, historical context, um, you know, knowing like, well, hey, two decades ago, that politician, this, and it's, again, it's context. And oh, we yeah. lose that and when the we... empathy that comes with age. Yes. Because that too, yeah. More. You can right. tell someone's story because you may understand a little bit more about what they're feeling. And that brings, mm -hmm. that's like that human element. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the not to say you can't have life experiences younger. And I feel like in TV news, it is weird because like when you're, when you're too young, so call it 21 to 26 or seven, you're too young. Yeah. And then there's a sweet spot from probably 27 to maybe 35 or six. And then after that, you start to worry that you may be too old and, and maybe you don't even get treated that way, but you have that fear anyway. Well, and there've been, there've been enough examples. I mean, I know Roma Tori and from New York one and, and her colleagues actually started a podcast called the five of us, which was all about ageism and in, in the news. And then there's, you know, countless examples like Lisa Laflame, or I might be saying her name incorrectly, but Lisa. Canada. Yeah. Yes, from Canada, who was basically kicked off the air after she allowed herself to go gray during COVID. I mean, this is real. This happens. And there's sort of unspoken rules as women in news. You know, you cannot look older than your age. You cannot even look close to your age, frankly. That's the wild and, thing. We're like half of the population. So yeah. why are we letting this happen? Just exactly. Out of curiosity. I know. And I, I feel like I'm actually contributing to it. Like I feel guilty. I get Botox like because I'm afraid of getting older. <laughs> I'm doing an ageism podcast and I'm getting Botox. Like I feel awful about it. Right. But this is the world. This this is the hand we're dealt. And I think we have to get at least we have to get more comfortable with who we are and what we're doing. And we have to just basically push away all those different notions that are forced on us by the beauty industry. It's a multi-gazillion dollar industry. Like uh -huh. I don't blame myself for being drawn to getting a needle full of neurotoxins put in my face. Like I get why I'm doing it and I don't blame anyone else for doing well, it either. But I think, I think, you know, too, that more people will listen to you, Maureen, if they like how you look. Oh, it's so true. And so There's if your message is important, then why not Botox, right? right? Because you will probably get a larger audience. It's very sad, but true. It matters. Yeah. And like I said, I don't think I would have as easy a time growing this podcast if I were plus 10 years. I truly don't. And so I feel like it's something that I can do, even though I've experienced less ageism at this point, given I'm only 40. But I can also tell you point blank, like I used to get outreach constantly, inbound outreach from recruiters all the time. And yes, the market sucks right now. There's no question about that. But as soon as I turned 40, it fell off a cliff. And that I, I'm not making it up. And I've talked to multiple other people. They've seen the same thing. And actually, there was just an EEOC complaint that was that was uh, or a suit that was filed. And these this company lost the lawsuit uh, on age discrimination in the application process. So they were using artificial intelligence, this ATS system to preclude people from age 55 for what this is amazing age 55 for women, but 60 for men, because again, women aren't allowed to get older and men are. Um, but they were actually routinely getting them out of the Canada pool on the basis of their age alone. And they got hit with this just recently, I think it was last month. Um, so this is happening. It's real. 
and you know people aren't making it up and there's certainly there's a lot of it's just it's a rough market so i don't want to suggest that's not the case and part of what's happening here it certainly is part of the puzzle but there's no question in my mind that there are some shitty companies out there who are absolutely like over 40 no thanks aren't you concerned that you're hurting your job prospects by having this podcast I was definitely concerned about that, but I thought to myself, if I don't do this, who will? And I felt like I was fortunate to be married to a person with health insurance. Like my husband has a job. It seems stable. It could always change, of course. Um, but then I also recognized that, you know, whatever company wouldn't want to hire me because I did this is not a place where I would want to work anyway. Yeah. And also operating under the whole concept of there's no such thing as bad press. People look good if you have someone who's a content creator, you know, that, that's that's companies want people who have a personal brand, you know, these terms that I don't necessarily care for personally, but they they're real. And and the, the the back the, the backstory for me, too, was I recognized I had seen, for example, Dan Lyons, who wrote a book called Disrupted. He joined HubSpot after a long sort of journalist journalistic career at Time and I think it was Time uh, magazine. And he was the technology reporter for many years. But he joined HubSpot at 52 years old and he talked about the ageism he faced. Guess where he works now? DocuSign. And I've actually had CEOs of companies reach out to me and say, I love your podcast so much. I don't have a job that's actually on the boards yet, but I know you do this partnerships work. And are you interested in applying for a job that's not even posted? So I figured that it might be the reason like I don't get some opportunities, but it'll also definitely be the reason if I choose to go back to tech that I get my next job. That's so great. I'm looking at it from that perspective. I think that's the best way to look at it, quite honestly. Kind and I feel way. like... <laughs> We're taking a stance and you're going to be hopefully helping people just if, yeah. if no actual change happens, they <laughs> will learn that they're not alone. And sometimes exactly. there is power in that. that 100% alone. belonging. So, talking about helping people though, you, you were talking about Botoxing your resume. So give... <laughs> Give our viewers who may be like hoping to get into tech and they're getting out of TV or whatever they're doing. Or like, any other job. What's yeah. not tech, by the way? Like everything's yeah, exactly. tech now. <laughs> so give us give us like two tips to Botox your resume or your LinkedIn. Yeah. So I would say use an older picture of yourself. Why not? I, I wouldn't go heavy on the AI personally. Like I don't think airbrushing is super great, but use an older picture of yourself, whatever. Do that. Help yourself out. Make it less likely someone's going to discriminate against you. You want as many at bats, it's a, it's a numbers game, right? So I would do that. And then I would also just remove your college graduation dates, like super simple, like really, really fast, just quick steps. And if you don't think it's gonna make a difference, try A-B testing. Mm. I'm, I'm pretty goddamn sure it's gonna be showing you that it's better to, to look as though you're younger. You, did you say too, yeah. like maybe take off your first job? Or don't put oh, yeah, on absolutely. Yeah. I mean, people can do math, right? So like take your first right. couple experiences off your resume and remove your college graduation dates, right? Because those early experiences are usually not all that relevant to what you're doing anyway. So that's so point? true. It's not even yeah, disingenuous. Start, you've got a couple more that are better after it anyway, right? I'll yeah, say I started fun. as morning anchor in Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> oh, you did? No. no, I didn't. I took okay. off my pre previous job. Like, 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 damn, that's a high number market, right? I like, what is I that? started in right. like Texas. <laughs> All right. That that would put me just starting in Miami. So fine. We're good with that. <laughs> Before you, you guys have the meteor, the meteoric rise we had. Yeah, meteor, just I have, I have one more question, Maureen, and yeah. I want to know how you untangle this. And I think I can say this now that our non-disclosure agreement... <laughs> is probably null and void, Megan. Oh my. Um, we noticed a pattern with the women who were laid off when we were laid off. And the pattern was they all had young children. Oh, so yuck. how do you untangle that though from ageism, right? Because Megan, there were certainly older women who were not laid off when we were laid off. But it seemed as if you were, if you were older or childless, Interesting. You weren't laid off. Okay. So if you were older and childless, you were not laid off, but if you were older, right. and or children, if you were, if you were older and childless or older with children who were capable yeah. of, uh -huh. you know, like high college, school or older. Yeah. So yeah. you were safe if you were older and childless or you had older kids who could like fend for themselves in the world or young and childless. In other words, you're not going to have to call out sick because your baby's home. Exactly. Well, I think that's very much in play. I think that a lot of it is about stage in life, not necessarily your chronic 
chronological age, but it's the optics. I mean, there's a reason, for example, that if I'm on a job interview, I expressly do not proactively mention my children. It does absolutely nothing for me, nothing. It only sets myself up for potential discrimination, right? So unless the hiring manager, and this could be a ruse, I don't want to suggest this to anyone, but like it could be a ruse, like, oh yeah, my kids, Tommy and Sally, blah, 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 to get you to open up and like share, you know, cause rapport building is a thing, right? Um, but I, I just don't offer that up unless there's a real compelling reason for it. Or on the flip side, I'm like, screw this. If they don't want me because I have kids, that's not the right place for me, right? Yeah. That's that's. But there are certain points where you can have that latitude and you are in a privileged enough position to say that. And there are other times where you're like, damn it, I just need a paycheck, right? Like, yeah. I gotta pay my rent, gotta pay my you know mortgage, whatever. So, but 100% people, people absolutely bias against those with ch children. And I can tell you, I was at a dinner with a bunch of folks, including a 31 year old who worked at Facebook or Meta, whatever the hell they want to call it now. Um, and she was talking about the people who were laid off on her team. And I was like, oh, interesting. So only two people got laid off. What were they like? Oh, they were both fathers, you know, and they were just like looking really tired all the time. And they were always, I'm not sure how committed they were. Like their kids were always coming into the frame. And I was like, Oh my God, like that is so heinous. I thought COVID was supposed to humanize work and allow us to like have both, you know, our work and our home life and pull them together. And nope, you were still being judged if you were a parent with your kids coming into the frame. So I was like, that sucks. And that's a younger person who had no kids. And so she had this, this bias, right? And so it, it was just plain as day to me, like we are still not safe to proactively talk about our kids, which is why I think especially at the highest levels of companies, loudly parenting is critically important. And let's face it, parents are more likely to be older employees. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Part. That's wild, isn't it? I still can't get away from the fact that half of the population is female and everyone mm -hmm. has a parent somewhere. Exactly. We like we're all going to get there. So, right. That's what, that's, what's just crazy to me. We don't mm -hmm. make those correlations between if you're not there yet, you will be soon and you won't want to be treated exactly. this way. Uh, you exactly. Do? Protect yeah. your future self, protect bias against your future self. If nothing, how else, does right? Megan change the Google result of how old <laughs> is Megan Glaros? Cause it's wrong, Maureen. It is actually it got me 10 years older wrong. than I am. How what? old am I? Where is that? It is empirically wrong. Oh. And I will, oh. I will vouch for that. Yeah. I know people at Google, I'll get right on that. It's <laughs> got me at least 10 years older than I am. And at first I was like really upset by it. But now at this point, I'm like, oh, not really upset, but like it was 10 years ago when I saw it. And I was like, what? Are you pulling it up or should That's I pull so it up? No, I didn't pull it up yet. But so here's the crazy thing. Now I'm kind of like, you know what? People are just going to think I look Check really good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, did I not tell you that's what happened? So, so Maureen, here's this funny story. I was talking to one of one of my clients essentially, and he was talking, we were talking about the craziness of TV news. And um, I, I said, oh yeah, well, the, the funnier thing is uh, my co-meteorologist, Megan Glaros, she got a permission form for a conjugal visit for an inmate. And Oh, isn't that funny? I said, but she's a total what? smoke show. So it makes a lot of sense. And so he went and he Googled it and he screen grabbed it. And he said, she's 48 years old. Are you kidding me? I'm not. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. Um, I'm probably more disturbed than anything about the, the concept of being reached out to for a conjugal. Uh, like, How old is Megan Claro? About 51 not 51 google see if you were a band it'd just give you more authority that's right you know and let's also talk about the fact that men like just they wear their hair gray white it's like all cool you know it's i noticed it when i was in tv news i was like cool so she's getting 17 pounds of makeup put on or she looks like a different like we were talking earlier about the power of makeup like it's like a face transplant. It's ridiculous. Like, yeah. and, and the and the people who do it at the news stations are incredibly gifted. Probably the best oh, women gosh. wedding makeup people, or I guess fashion people, whatever. But like the men would just get like, oh, man, oh you're good to go. Little, just go crush powder. it. Braids everywhere, and it's it's just it's such a double standard. So I think you know, step one is awareness, and sadly, like you said who is giving the message is, is important. And so are people more likely to talk to someone who's in her forties and looks relatively youthful or someone in their sixties, who's talking about ageism. We know the answer to that. Yes. So. It's, so uh, Maureen, we usually do like these boilerplate questions, but I think that they're not necessarily applicable to you, but I would wonder if there was a craziest story that you would like to share from your time in the TV trenches. Oh yeah. What I guess trenches. I, I mean, Oh yeah, the tech trenches. Well, I, the one that comes to mind. Both. 
I've got, I, I mean, I've got plenty from both, but the, the one that comes to mind from TV specifically is uh, <laughs> there was one anchor who shall remain nameless on this podcast because I'm going to be a good person and I don't want her people coming after me. But apparently there was one anchor who fell asleep or excuse me, who, wow. Okay. Let's re reverse that. Sorry. Sometimes I'm the worst storyteller. So thanks for pretending that I'm good at it. But there was one anchor who went on the air live and I guess had not reviewed any of her scripts at all or anything and just was, you know, relying completely on the teleprompter. And one of my producer friends at this company fell asleep because, you know, news hours, right? Like everybody's exhausted and she fell asleep at the teleprompter and this anchor flubbed it massively on the air and looked like an idiot and then was out for blood and was trying to get this person fired. And I was like, I kind of feel like that's on you, man. Like read your scripts, like ad lib, you know, you're a pro, come on. But it was, it was pretty bad. It was pretty bad. And I maybe you don't think that's even a crazy offline. story, <laughs> but like, ooh. listen, there it. There are so many crazy stories in, I, in any industry, really. I mean, I talked to my friends who are nurses and they could tell you some crazy, crazy stories that would put any TV story to shame. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, the stories that I, I some of them, I, I honestly, I've signed NDA, so I can't even describe what happened in tech, but just everything you could possibly, I mean, read. But read. NDAs, we just read a headline that said NDAs aren't valid anymore. Oh, really? Yeah, especially, call my if they were, especially if they were tied to money and we got a severance for hours. Oh, very interesting. Oh my gosh, yeah, I want to dive into that. Yeah, no, I want to dive into that. Well, I, I, I should probably check with my personal attorney first, but that's um, that's yeah. I don't know if that's true. You can come back. We'll have you back on. Yeah, I can come back on. I can yeah. come back on. Absolutely. Um, um, yeah. How do people find you, Maureen? I've I've got your website up here, and I know you. your podcast. I'm on all reference? the platforms. I'm on all the platforms. What'd you say? It's a sports reference. Ah, yes. Yogi Berra, the late great Yogi Berra. The only time I'm going to quote a New York Yankee ever because I'm a Mariners girl th through and through. But uh, Yogi Berra said it gets late early. And he was talking about the conditions out in left field and the sun. But you know, it really was applicable to this. And if you want to be relevant in tech, you should probably talk about sports in such a heavily bro dominated <laughs> industry. So, you know, and also I go by Mo for a reason. Like there's a point to that. Like one of the boys here going to go to the bar with all the sales bros until 2 a.m. and show them, even if I'm th literally throwing the shot behind my shoulder, I'm going to be there. Right. <laughs> it's what you got to do. I yeah. wish I could take a shot with you. Mo. I know. This was a I, lot of fun. This was so much fun. Let's make sure we can make it happen at some point. Maybe Nashville, Nashville next great. time. That would yeah. be good. <laughs> All right, Maureen Clough, thank you very much. We will link to your uh, website and everything in our description with the video, but thank you so much for coming on. It was real fun talking to you. This was a blast, guys. Thanks for what you're doing. Yep. Bye, Maureen. Bye, Megan. Bye.